Remember the government increased paid maternity leave from 12 weeks to 26 weeks? That progressive law may prove to be counterproductive. An estimated 1.8 million women could lose their jobs this financial year, finds a study. The Supreme Court says the centre is free to inquire into charges against the ED officer investigating the SL Maxis case. P. Chidambaram's son Karthi is an accused in the case. And Messi's magic and Maradona's antics had fans in thrall as Argentina made the knockouts of the FIFA World Cup 2018. Here in India, a whopping 47 million people watch the opening matches, says the official broadcaster. It's Thursday, June 28th. Only 27% of Indian women are in the workforce, as per the International Labour Organization. The global average is 40%. A 2015 Global Gender Gap Report ranked India 136 among 144 countries on economic participation and opportunities. 66% of women's work in India is unpaid. The comparative figure for men is only 12%. This report by the World Bank, based on government data between 2004 and 2012, said 19.6 million women dropped out of the workforce during this period, of which rural women accounted for 53%. Among the many reasons for the gap is maternity, women unable to come back to the workforce after having a child. Aimed at retaining women in the organised sector, the government brought the Maternity Benefit Amendment Act, which increased paid maternity leave from a period of 12 weeks to 26 weeks. A year later, a study by Team Lees shows the legislation has been counterproductive to the new women workforce participation in the next one to four years. The report estimates the loss of jobs was between 1.1 to 1.8 million for the year 2017-18, Companies looked at the extension of paid maternity leave as increased cost, which may have discouraged them from hiring women. The study shows that startups, small and medium enterprises, closely held family run businesses perceive the amendment as a deterrent and are likely to reduce the intake of women. Some sections of small and medium enterprises, which includes manufacturing and services businesses, may resort to unethical practices, such as decreasing the salary up front at the point of hiring, as well as reducing the intake of women. The report argues, as with most reform of such scale, the mechanics of change are as critical as the reform itself. One of the gravest implications in the short term will be that most employers, especially those in small and medium enterprises, where there are margin pressures, will reduce the intake of women employees as they cannot take the burden of benefits onto themselves. It is therefore important that the government works out a benefit scheme, rebate, that actually offsets the cost for the employers who can then continue to hire women without being concerned about the cost and affordability aspects. Economist Ajit Ranade writing in The Mint agrees. He says, while India passed this very progressive maternity benefits law, it is clear that some of the cost of this legislation should be subsidized. One key ingredient of Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's economic revival strategies was to increase female participation in the workforce. Abe made it a priority to build almost half a million government-funded creches to help young mothers join the workforce. Availability of quality daycare is one factor which inhibits women from returning to work after their maternity leave. During Abe's term, female participation in the workforce went up by almost 5% in Japan, and that has definitely helped economic growth. Apart from the critical issue of gender parity, there is also a definitive value to increased women's participation in the workforce. As this Power of Parity report by McKinsey details, if the gender gap, it says, is addressed, India could boost its GDP by $0.7 trillion in 2025. This translates into 1.4% per year of incremental GDP growth. Will Enforcement Directorate Officer Rajeshwar Singh continue to be part of the probe into the SL Maxis case in which former Finance Minister P. Chidambaram's son, Karthi Chidambaram, is an accused? 
The Supreme Court, while hearing a petition seeking an inquiry into the alleged disproportionate assets held by the officer, said it was up to the government to decide. But the court favoured a probe into the allegation, saying no officer should be under any cloud. The CBI and the Enforcement Directorate are investigating the foreign investment clearance granted in 2006 for the SL Maxis deal when Chidambaram was Finance Minister in the UPA government. The senior Congress leader had applied for relief from arrest which the Delhi High Court had granted till the 10th of July. In 2016, we produced 44.7 million metric tons around 4,500 Eiffel Towers worth of e-waste globally. India, the world's fourth largest generator of e-waste, contributed 2 million metric tons, which is 5% of that. Asocham estimated that India would generate at least 5.2 million metric tons per annum by 2020. Yet, most of us remain unaware of how to dispose of our e-waste. So, what exactly happens once you're done with a gadget? It's cracked open, dismantled into various components, dipped in hot acid, and then taken through an extraction process where components of precious metal like gold and copper are separated from the motherboard. And it's good stuff. One metric ton of e-waste has more gold than 17 tons of gold ore. A ton of mobile phones yield an average of 130 kilograms of copper, 3.5 kilograms of silver, and 0.14 kilogram palladium. E-waste produced in 2016 in India itself could fetch a whopping 55 billion euros. Looking to cash in on this, registered recyclers increased by 15% between 2005 and 2014 and have a total capacity to process 4,55,059 tons of e-waste per annum. Yet, close to 80% of e-waste is broken down by an informal sector in cities like Silampur, Moradabad, Meerut and Ferozabad. Adolescent children in sheds without proper equipment or training or even gloves exposing them to deadly radiation in exchange for wages of around 200 rupees per day. Why? The cheapness of the informal sector, the 12% tax on electronic recyclers and perhaps the lack of implementation of effective legislation. So, what can you and I do? Whom should we be giving our e-waste to? Ideally, no one. All your electronic goods are supposed to be collected by the companies you buy them from and they are supposed to send it to registered recyclers. And there's a law that says so. In 2011, India framed its first law on e-waste management, wherein the producer of electrical and electronic equipment had the responsibility of managing equipment after its end of life. In 2016, the law was amended, the e-waste management rules. The focus was now on stopping companies from using hazardous materials like lead, mercury and cadmium in their products. A network for monitoring was set up. Now companies had to declare that they weren't using above accepted levels of pollutants. And now the Central Pollution Control Board could monitor and sample electrical equipment on the market at random. Through this, 200 companies were served notices by the Central Pollution Control Board just this January. But companies were still not taking back the e-waste from their own produce. So, on March 22nd this year, the law was amended again. Called E-Waste Amendment Rules 2018, the law now mandates yearly e-waste collection targets for industries based on their size, but allows leeways for small companies. However, it still fails to notch up penalties or create policy to regulate the unauthorized e-waste sector. And the fact that Messi finally scored in Argentina progress to the knockouts may have been the big headline from FIFA 2018, but the legendary Maradona's off-field antics garnered almost as much attention. Maradona was treated by paramedics after he appeared to collapse following Argentina's do-or-die match against Nigeria. For the legend's many fans in India, Kerala in particular, he says he's doing fine, guys. By the way, 
according to Sony Pictures Networks India, which holds the media rights for the 2018 FIFA World Cup. Around 47.3 million viewers watched the tournament in the first 48 hours in India. Nearly 30% of the viewership came from Kerala, 28% and 20% respectively came from the Northeast and West Bengal. 45% of all viewers were women. Enjoy the games and meet us back here tomorrow.